Yeah, welcome for another session uh, in the grammatical theory lecture. Um, last time we dealt with government and binding and uh, in particular with the verb position, so how to get the verb in initial position in, in German clauses and um, how to place a constituent in the forefield, in the pre-field. Uh, non-local uh, dependencies and how to account for that in transformation-based theory in, in a transformation-based variant um, government and binding. Today we want to deal with passive and local reordering, also known as scrambling. Uh, reading material is uh, the grammar theory textbook and there it's sections 3, 4 and 3, 5. Uh, in order to uh, be able to account for the passive, um, we have to deal with some uh, terminology. Uh, researchers distinguish between structural and lexical case and um, I want to motivate this distinction uh, in what's coming next and explain uh, what kind of um, division between structure and lexical case uh, is made in this uh, textbook or in this lecture. <laughs> so the question is what types of case uh, exist and um, in which way does case depend on syntactic context and if we look at examples like 103, um, we, we see that the, the same verb can uh, appear with different or with arguments in a different case. So if you look at 103a, er möchte das Buch lesen, you see uh, that there is a verb read, lesen, uh, and that the subject of lesen is uh, nominative, uh, it's green, he, and the object, das Buch, um, is realized as accusative. Now, if you look at uh, 103b, you see that the subject of lesen is uh, in a different case. So it's in, that's uh, accusative, and the, the object is in the same case. So in, in, uh, if you have a traditional approach to grammar and you say, okay, you have some valence representation that tells you um, a verb goes together with uh, an accusative and uh, a nominative and an accusative or a nominative and a dative. So something like a valency dictionary uh, that you can buy as, a, as printed books, right? So if you look it up, uh, the, the, the verb in, or if you look a verb up in, in this dictionary, it tells you it needs an e, ak, and e nom or something like ergänzung, nominative, ergänzung, accusative. So if you, follow that approach, you would need a different lexical item for this uh, verb because it has an accusative, not a nominative. That's sort of not really nice. And the way out of this is that one says, okay, the, the lexicon doesn't say which uh, case that will be. It just says, okay, this, this, the, the case of this argument depends on the structure in which uh, the argument is realized. And then the structure says, okay, this is nominative and here in this situation, it has to be accusative, right? So that's the idea. It's a clever trick of underspecifying uh, the case of arguments. Okay, so there, there are situations where we have to specify the case in the lexicon because it, it never changes uh, in whatever uh, structure we use it. And this is um, called lexical case. But if the uh, case depends on the structure, uh, then we talk about uh, structural case. So what structural cases are there? Um, so let's have a look at some simple examples. The, First example um, is the, the subject of 
of verbs. Um, here we have an intransitive verb and 104, der Installateur kommt. Um, so that's nominative. Um, you can embed such verbs or almost all verbs under um, causative verbs like lassen, let, and then you get uh, der Mann lässt den Installateur kommen. That's uh, the, the phenomena or the, the class of verbs that does that do that does that do this uh, is uh, called also called ACI uh, verb. Uh, that's uh, Latin for accusative with infinitive. So this the the let the causative assigns accusative to this thing or it requires an accusative there and um, then there is an infinitival form of the verb. And then the, the third uh, configuration is uh, nominalizations. Das Kommen des Installateurs um, is wichtig, uh, notwendig. Um, here we have um, the argument of come uh, realized in the genitive. So it's the same verb, but uh, sometimes the argument is nominative, sometimes accusative, and sometimes genitive. Um, there are other arguments of the verb, like uh, accusative objects that are accusative and the active, and they can also be realized in the nominative and in the genitive. So example, Judith uh, schlägt den Weltmeister, so that's about a um, chess championship, um, and uh, the object of beat is an accusative uh, noun phrase. And if you passivize the sentence, der Weltmeister wird geschlagen, then you have a nominative. And uh, if you put that in nominalization environment, das Schlagen des Weltmeisters ist nicht einfach or something like that, then you get a genitive. And so the idea is to say, okay, objects uh, get um, accusative if, if they have structural case. So that's a, um, they are in a position uh, to where they get structural case and um, subjects get nominatives and uh, nominative and um, in uh, nominal environments, um, noun phrases with structural case get genitive. Okay, uh, on the other hand, we have a lexical case. So uh, an example is uh, the genitive that is uh, assigned by verbs um, to, to their objects. So uh, 106 is an example, wir gedenken der Opfer. So here we have a genitive object. And the interesting thing if, is if we passivize the sentence, then uh, the uh, NP stays in the genitive. So it's not uh, realized as nominative or anything else, right? And we cannot have nominative as in C, uh, die Opfer wird gedacht or die Opfer werden gedacht. Um, the, the latter version is possible, but um, then uh, it has a, has a different, uh, the verb has a different meaning. Okay, so that means this, this NP has to have genitive in all possible thinkable situations. So it never changes. And that's uh, an indication for lexical case. Okay, um, now what do we do um, with a dative? So we, we talked about nominative and accusative and genitive, and there's one more case left in German, the dative. And the question is, should that be lexical or uh, structural if we are talking about um, arguments of verbs? Okay, let's look at uh, the active passive alternation. Der Mann hat ihm geholfen, ihm wird geholfen. So that looks like uh, the case with the genitive. Um, so fine, it should be a lexical case, right? But then there is this so-called dative passive. It's yeah, it's a problem. Der Mann hat den Ball dem Jungen geschenkt. So here we have a dative object. But then 
we can uh, use become, erhalten, and kriegen, and form uh, sentences like 108b, der Junge bekam den Ball geschenkt. Now we have a nominative. So if we apply our criterion saying, okay, if the, the, the case changes according to the syntactic environment, it should be a structural case. Hmm. So we have a problem. So this, this suggests that it doesn't change. This suggests that it does change. What do we do? We are stuck. Um, in such situations, um, you sometimes get the, the situation that half of the scientific community has one opinion and the other half has another opinion. And that's basically also the uh, case with uh, structural versus lexical dative. Um, so the the status of these datives is controversial. The, there are basically three options. Um, so one could assume that all datives are lexical. Uh, one could assume that some datives are lexical and some are structural. Or one could assume that some that that all datives are structural. Okay, what do we do? Um, if we assume that dative is a lexical case, which I do, um, then uh, we have a problem with a dative passive. So, th but th there, there's a sort of uh, hacky way out of it. Uh, one can just say, okay, this, the, the dative is a lexic case, but in the a dative passive, um, it's changed into a structural case. So that's something that the dative passive auxiliary does. If we, assume that, that the dative is a lexical case, we get uh, the data, uh, an explanation for the data in 109, um, where we really see that certain things are not possible compared to accusatives, where we say that they are structural. So in 109 ABC, you have um, the, Situation with a verb that takes an accusative, er streichelt den Hund, der Hund wurde gestreichelt, so that's a nominative. And you, you can have the nominalization, sein Streicheln des Hundes. So here the accusative is realized as genitive. If you compare that with a help, with that taking a dative, um, er hilft den Kindern, he helps the children, um, den Kindern wurde geholfen. Here the, the dative does not change. And um, then you have um, nominalizations, das helfen der Kinder. Uh, that's possible, but it's only possible with, uh, of the children as an agent, right? So it's not, uh, this is not a minimal pair, uh, F and D, right? So it does not, uh, relate to this example, but to another example. And you see that uh, if you look at uh, uh, the G example, where the where we have a possessive here that takes the agent role, basically. So sein helfen der Kinder is out, because this would then be the dative object, and the dative object cannot be realized in nominal uh, environments. So if you say this is a lexical case, then you have an explanation for that. If not, then you have to come up with other explanations. So I would really prefer uh, this uh, solution that was suggested by Hubert Heider. Um, the, the only way to express the dative uh, uh, in these nominalizations is to express it pre-nominally, das den Kindern helfen. Um, so here the, the dative is sort of inside a VP that is nominalized, right? So it, it's getting the, the lexical case inside there and um, it's not an uh, argument within the noun phrase. Um, let's, let's have a look at the other options. So one idea is to say that all datives are structural, but then there is a big problem 
uh, with data like 111. Er hilft ihm, er unterstützt ihn. Um, in, in one example, uh, you have a dative and in another one you have an accusative. So if you would say that both the dative and the accusative are structural cases, um, then there wouldn't be a difference in, in the lexical items of these two verbs, right? And uh, there's no explanation why one is uh, dative and one is accusative. So you, you have to have uh, a difference. Um, and yeah, so uh, th that sort of says that the option that all datives are structural wouldn't work. But um, what people suggested uh, who wanted to have a, um, the dative as a structural case is that they say, okay, uh, if we have three valent verbs, then we can say, we have a, a most prominent argument and a least prominent argument, and then there is some in, one in the middle. And the most prominent is nominative, the least prominent is accusative, and the one in the middle uh, is dative. So uh, this is something that Dieter Wunderlich suggested. And he would then say, okay, um, for the two place verbs, you have uh, the most prominent uh, and the least prominent, and that's nominative and accusative. And then if you have um, uh, these dative cases, you have to mark them as exceptional. So you have to say, this is dative, it's a lexical case. Um, the interesting thing is that these uh, approaches predict that the because they assume that the dative of um, two place verbs is a lexical case, that these verbs cannot appear in the dative passive, right? So the, the dative is fixed as a lexical case. So that means uh, it cannot change in the dative passive. And that prediction seems to be wrong. Um, so there are examples that were discussed in the literature. Er kriegte von vielen geholfen, gratuliert, applaudiert, or man kriegte täglich gedankt. So the question is whether they are well-formed, whether that is German or not. And um, of course, there are many claims in the literature about uh, sentences that are possible or not possible. And sometimes it depends on the theory of the authors, um, whether they believe uh, or they, the, the, the judgments fit the theory, let's say it that way, right? And um, so the question is, if we build really um, enormous theoretical um, buildings on top of uh, shaky data, whether that is a good idea. And uh, in such situations, it's often good to check for corpus data and uh, have a look whether certain things exist and maybe do experiments uh, to have a really um, solid empirical foundation. So, this is what I uh, found in corpora, and indeed uh, such examples uh, seem to exist. Um, example, da kriege ich geholfen, heute Morgen bekam ich sogar schon gratuliert. Klärle hat es wirklich mehr als verdient, auch einmal, auch mal zu einem unrunden Geburtstag gratuliert zu bekommen, mit dem alten Titel von Elvis Presley, I can't help falling in love. Uh, bekam Kassier Markus Reis zum Geburtstag gratuliert. So these are um, sentences that, that are pretty normal, I think. And um, what I guess is happening is that the, that verbs like become um, develop into auxiliaries and um, auxiliaries are known, uh, well, let's say to be promiscuous, so they don't have strong restrictions on the verb they, verbs they combine with. And um, this is a process. So the auxiliaries uh, developed from, from main verbs uh, into uh, 
light verbs with not much, uh, not so uh, um, fixed contributions, uh, not so strong contributions as the main verbs. Um, and that's also happening with the uh, dative passive uh, auxiliary. So um, one can see that they are losing selection restrictions, like requiring subjects or animate uh, uh, event participants and so on. And um, you, you see here that there's even an early example from the Feldpost archive uh, from 43. And then there are more recent uh, examples showing that uh, this is possible. Okay, so how does uh, case assignment? So, so what I told you until now is something that we will uh, reuse uh, when we talk about other theories. So that's basically the structural case, lexical case distinction. And now we are turning to um, the concrete proposal in, in government and binding uh, and how they um, do case assignment in this theory. So we have lexical case on the one hand that's assigned by the verb, no problem. And then we have uh, the structural case and verb, verbs assign their objects accusative um, if the object has structural case. Then we have finite infill or T and more recent var variants of the theory. And this uh, infill assigns nominative to the subject. There's one important ingredient of the theory that's a case filter. It says that every NP has to have case. So you cannot have NPs somewhere in the, in the tree that do not or did not get a case from somewhere, from some case assigning head. So if you have a, like a syntactic tree as output of your derivation, uh, and there are NPs in that that do not have case, then they are, then the, the tree is not well formed. Uh, and furthermore, um, there's an assumption that case is assigned under government. Um, that is that only NPs in certain tree positions may get case. We talked about government in the first uh, session where I talked about the basic assumptions. It's um, the, the idea is that you, that a verb can assign to um, the NP, assign case to the NPs next to it, but not inside uh, uh, case in, to, to elements inside of this NP. So that sort of keeps things a bit more local. Okay, so now how do we do passive? Um, there are basically the, the analysis can be described as uh, on the, the with some sentences as, as they are given on this slide. The assumption is that the subject gets case from I the, in the spec IP position and uh, other arguments get the case from the verb. The passive blocks the subject in the lexicon. So that's what, what passive does, right? And um, the accusative object gets a semantic role, but no case. Um, so the, the, this is also something that is done in the lexicon that it's just said, okay, the, the case assignment doesn't take place anymore. So the accusative object um, is still sort of selected uh, in the valence frame of the verb, but uh, it doesn't get case. So um, because of the case filter, uh, that wouldn't work as a derivation. And hence the uh, object of the verb has to move to another position where it gets case. That's the uh, uh, spec IP position. So it moves to the subject position and gets the nominative there. So this is um, some, some visualization. So you see some analysis first and uh, active uh, sentence. Um, dass der Mann der Frau den Jungen zeigt. You have an 
accusative object here, it gets uh, uh, um, accusative case and uh, a semantic role. You have the data here, uh, it gets um, the, the um, again, case and the semantic role. And you have uh, the nominative here that gets case from I uh, and uh, a semantic role from the verb. So that's, the, the, the figure has some problems or some specific things you, you should be aware of. So first, I, I just had this binary branching uh, structure here. Um, usually, we, we said that X bar requires that our complements are realized uh, in the uh, next projection of the, of the verb. But that's um, problematic because um, government and binding assumes binary branching structures. And um, there are also reasons for this uh, because the adverbs can appear between uh, the arguments. So we want to have binary branching structures here. I just uh, assumed that it's um, uh, rebar projections. And um, there is another problem because that uh, uh, assignment of a semantic rule shouldn't be possible because it's uh, crossing the VP node. Chomsky has a, a suggestion how to deal with uh, such things. He says that it's not the verb, but it's the VP that assigns um, that semantic rule. And the question is why? So he, he says, okay, it depends on the argument, uh, the object, which uh, meaning the whole VP has, but that can also be done in a lexicon. Um, and the question is, okay, if this VP can govern something here, why can't any other projection do that, right? So it's just a stipulation. And um, we, we talked uh, in, in the question period, we talked about formalization uh, uh, of, of series. And this is something that is not formalized. So, and it's not trivial. Um, so think about how to do that, how to write that up, that uh, which, uh, phrase may govern and uh, so on. So what seems to be easier in terms of formalization, formalization is that you allow um, uh, to the government to pass through VPs to reach uh, the IP position. That seems to be uh, straightforward. Okay, so um, the, going back to that figure, um, the the verb assigns case and semantic role to its object and a semantic role to the subject. And then the I assigns the nominative to the subject. And passive looks like this. We have, uh, so I, 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 I cheated again. I don't want to deal with um, the participle verb combination. So in some versions of the theory, you have full phrases, uh, verb phrases embedded under uh, the auxiliary, um, that will get terribly complex. And I think it's wrong because German has verbal complexes, but don't, don't worry about that. So we just have this tri triangle here and ignore the details. So, but, but the important thing is that the uh, main verb does not assign case to that NP anymore. It does assign a semantic role and it does assign case and semantic role to the data, uh, but not to this, uh, not, no case is assigned to this thing. So, because that, so this little NP is sitting there and says, oh, I don't have case. Damn, what do I do? There is this um, case filter and it will get me. So, it says, okay, I rather go to a different place where I get a uh, case. So it goes here and it gets case from the, uh, from I. And so all uh, non-phrases have case. And it also has a theta role that sort of, ah, okay, sorry. So the theta role was assigned here, right? So you, we don't have to assign something to here. 
uh, but uh, we assigned it to here. The, the subject um, that, that would have been here was suppressed, right? Okay. Um, okay, so that's basically the analysis of the passive. There are some remarks on that uh, analysis. It works very nicely for English. So if you look at 114, the mother gave the girl a cookie and the passive version, the girl was given a cookie. You have to put that girl into uh, the initial position. Uh, it's uh, the subject and the subject has to be placed to the left of uh, the verb. That's English as SVO, so that's uh, what you get. It's rather strict. Of course, we, we saw how we can form questions and so on, so we can move the auxiliary around the subject, but it has to be there at some level of um, the representation. Okay, so um, if, if you look at German, the situation is totally different, right? Um, in in uh, in A we have the uh, the active example, weil das Mädchen dem Jungen den Ball schenkte, and now if we if we uh, passiveize that, weil dem Jungen der Ball geschenkt wurde, we see okay, the the ball is still to the right of dem Jungen, right? We can also uh, have the order in C weil der Ball dem Jungen geschenkt wurde. Um, but uh, this is, uh, the, the B example is a so-called unmarked order. So there is a, a, a very good paper by Tilman Höhle um, explaining what the marked and the unmarked orders uh, are. And it's basically you, you, you check in which context you can use a sentence. And if there are more uh, contexts uh, a sentence can be used in, then this is the unmarked order. And um, the B example is the unmarked order. And um, basically the generalization is that, that uh, animate uh, NPs precede in animate ones. So the datas are usually animate and uh, accusatives uh, in animate. So we have dative before uh, accusative. So this is what we have here. But interestingly, we also have that in the passive. So this thing here uh, just gets nominative, but it stays at the end, right? So it, the passive doesn't have anything to do with movement. Right? Um, it's just in, uh, in SVO languages like English that we need the subject in a certain position uh, that it's sort of encoded uh, positionally which element is a subject. Um, but that's not true for, for, um, for German, for instance. Um, and in German, we don't even have to have a subject, right? So we have impersonal passive, we have subjectless verbs. Um, so there is no subject position that has to be filled uh, of Teufel komm raus, so to say, uh, in uh, German idiom. Um, so if, if you want to sort of derive this uh, order and passive does this, then you would have to say, okay, because of passive, their ball moves to the front, and then Dem Jung has to be ordered in front of that. So that, that would be very complex, a very complex analysis um, that um, does not correspond to the unmarked nature uh, of this example here. Okay, so the solution is uh, not to do that movement that I just described, but um, to have abstract movement. So uh, Grevendorf suggested this in, in various, in a book and in a, in a paper um, saying, okay, um, the ball does not move, but there is an empty expletive element in the IP position that is connected to the ball. The empty expletive gets case and transfers this case to the ball. So this is a highly complex mechanism 
and it involves something that I think is really terrible. So it's an empty element. So if you if you say empty element and there are construction grammarians around, they will uh, get very angry uh, at you. And I, I think that's that's not correct. So empty elements are okay sometimes. So the, the argument is you cannot see them and how should they be uh, acquired by language learners um, if there is no evidence. The, the question is if there is evidence or not. And um, I think if you uh, get clues from, from the distribution of material that you see, okay, there is something uh, in some situations and then uh, it's, it's absent in other situations and it has the, the structure overall uh, sentence utterance has the same meaning, then you can infer that it's just left out and there you, you can assume a grammar that, that assumes an empty element. So that's what we did in the first lecture, right? Uh, if you remember, um, we had the uh, nominal structures with missing nouns in German. Um, it's basically like the pronoun one, uh, a, a smart one in English. Uh, you can leave out this one in, in German. It's, it's, there's nothing visible, right? So that, that is okay, I think. But what is not okay is an empty uh, expletive. And that's what Grevendorf suggests. So it's something that's sitting there that has no meaning. It's just there to save the analysis. It, and the analysis is built on wrong assumption that passive has something to do with movement. If you split um, the, the properties of having a subject uh, and having the subject in a certain position from um, active passive alternations, then uh, the problem disappears, right? So, so you don't have to assume that passive is somehow, uh, that, that movement is involved in passive. Okay, so I think that Empty expletives are really bad things. They are just there to, to save an analysis that is motivated by another language. And this is something that is really problematic because that cannot be acquired. You cannot say, okay, uh, if I knew English where I would acquire this structure, then uh, I can could take that over to German. That, that's something that, that linguists do, but children acquiring, acquiring a language do not, right? So, the, um, the, the grammars we uh, stipulate should be acquirable by, uh, from evidence from one language, not uh, cross-linguistically um, uh, motivated. I mean, we, we can motivate our grammars cross with cross-linguistic consideration, but uh, the result should be something that is acquirable from language data from one la language. So we will learn about uh, other approaches to passive that do not uh, make these assumptions and are much less complex. Okay, the last topic for today is uh, local reordering. Um, if we look at uh, the examples in 116, um, 16a is uh, an example with a ditransitive verb um, with uh, nominative, dative, accusative, and um, the, the arguments are said uh, to be in the unmarked order. That's uh, the paper by Höhle I already cited. Um, he says, okay, this sentence can be used in most contexts. So if you learn German and you wonder about the, the order of the constituents, you may just use the, the order in 116a. You, your language output may be a little bit boring, but uh, in principle, that should be the order that uh, is usable in, in all contexts. Um, there, there are, if you have three arguments, we have, uh, six possibilities uh, to, to permute them. So six possible permutations. Um, and uh, they are given in, in B to F. The idea, well, there are basically two approaches uh, for accounting for these orders. Uh, the first one is, uh, 
uh, that that one assumes that there is a base order that would be the the first example, and that all other orders are derived from that by movement. That's that was suggested by Werner Frey, and then there is uh, the assumption of, of a base generation approach by Giesbert van Zelo. Let's have a look at the movement approach. Um, we have, we have Das Buch der Mann dem Kind gibt. Um, here, the, uh, this is a dative uh, NP, and that would be the place of the accusative uh, NP. And uh, here you see a trace, and the, uh, the NP Das Buch is moved to the left and uh, adjoined to NP, the uh, IP. So we have an IP here, and then we have a new IP node and the accusative in front of that. If we have uh, an example with uh, the, both of the objects in front of the subject, we get the stacking here. So the dative is moved. Oh, well, first we have to move the um, accusative, it attaches here, and then the dative uh, attaches here. Okay, so um, what are the uh, pros and cons? So um, I, when, when I, I remember a, a talk I gave in Potsdam in uh, 2000, in the year 2000, um, where I suggested uh, um, the base generation approach in basically, or a version of, of this in HPSG. And uh, Dieter Staudacher said, um, well, but um, there, there is the scope problem, right? So you have to have a movement uh, uh, account because of quantifier scope. And, um, this is was what Werner Frey uh, published in, in a book by in 93. Uh, he discussed examples like 117. Um, es ist nicht der Fall, dass er mindestens einem Verleger fast jedes Gedicht anbot. So we have mindestens ein, at least one, and fast jedes, almost every. And in this um, order, the mindestens ein has scope over uh, fast jedes. So the, there's a certain quantifier scope. Now, if you take the object and front that, you get two readings. So you get one quantifier scope where this outscopes uh, mindestens ein, and then you get another reading that corresponds to that one. So the idea was, okay, you to get the other uh, reading, you reconstruct uh, to this position. So you put the, the move thing back, right, and get the other ordering. Um, the problem of this uh, is uh, that if you move two things, as you can see uh, two slides back, um, if you move two objects, you would predict that you can reconstruct each of them individually and uh, you would get one additional reading that is not there. It's not attested in the data. And um, that was noted by, by Tibor Kiss and uh, Giesbert Fanzelow. And um, so, so, so it's, it's, if you think about this in, in, in terms of movement, right, you would have to move these two together. And since their relative order does not change, um, the, the, the scope possibilities do not change. So there have to be other accounts of uh, the, the scopings and um, the movement-based approach makes wrong predictions. There have been attempts to fix that. So one paper by Sauerland and Elborn uh, discusses uh, the problem in, in the minimalist program. They, they discuss Japanese data, but it's the same basically. It's um, Japanese is a SOV language like German, and the problem is this it was also a scrambling reordering of arguments, and the problem is the same there. So they suggest uh, something um, 
in, that that involves even more uh, movements, additional movements, and uh, some of these movements take place at PF, uh, phonological form, uh, without having a semantic effect. So remember the T model. So in the beginning, we uh, initially we have the D structure, then we have some movements derive S structure, and then PF uh, for pronunciation and LF for semantic interpretation. And they say, okay, we have the, the S structure, then go to, to PF, do some further movement there, and uh, LF cannot see these uh, movements. So that's really, really complicated. And the question is, how should that be acquired, right? So it's, it's far away from, from the observable data. And um, th the question is, how can children acquire that without having some knowledge about that these complex uh, pr procedures and possibilities in their uh, genetic endowment. And since we don't want to have that complicated stuff uh, in the genetic endowment, it's uh, unrealistic from a biological perspective, as biologists tell us, um, co-authors of Chomsky and other biologists uh, tell us, um, that analysis is, is not really an option. So um, it seems to be that uh, we have to go for the base generation approach. That's what other theories do. And um, the, the problem then is that uh, if we stick to the IP approach, then the, the subject is only there in the, in the spec IP uh, position. Um, and if we allow for base generation of different orders in the VP, then we, and now you have to see my hands, but <laughs> I decided not to show you the video. But um, yeah, if, if you have, if you can scramble in the VP, then um, uh, you cannot get out of the VP. So, and the examples where stuff is in front of the subject cannot be accounted for. So examples like das Buch uh, der Mann dem Kind gibt, where the, the accusative object is before uh, the nominative, or accusative and dative are before the nominative, and so on. So these are not uh, accountable uh, in, in an IP approach, where the subject is only there in, in spec IP and not inside VP. So the, the real solution to most of the problems here is, seems to be that we, have, we don't have an IP for German. That's something that's suggested by Hubert Haider. And uh, we have base generation for all these orders. And that's basically what uh, category grammar and HPSG are doing. And we will uh, come back to that once we are uh, looking at the theories in more detail. Okay, if, if you assume that, then uh, um, the, seat, the space generation approach, uh, then the CETA rules are assigned in tandem with argument selection. So that's part of the valence frame. And uh, one wouldn't assign the CETA rule to certain positions because you don't have, you have different base positions, right? So um, that wouldn't make sense. Okay, uh, to sum up, um, the main goals of uh, government and binding uh, or transformational series in, in particular were to capture uh, the generalizations, the, the relation between certain structures. So for instance, active and passive sentences, the verb last and verb initial verb second position, placement of the verb, um, the almost free order of constituents in the middle field. And um, that was done in mappings from D structure to S structure. Um, one major topic is the explanation of language acquisition. And it's um, always, or it, it, in, in the GB area, it was uh, assumed that there's a general rule schema holding for all languages and all structures, the XPA theory. 
and that there are general principles holding for all languages and uh, paired with parameters um, that can be chosen for a specific language. That uh, model of language acquisition basically didn't turn out a huge success. Um, nowadays, more and more people uh, give it up, but uh, it was very fruitful for doing typological research and uh, a lot of progress was made in um, respect to, to data and to classifying languages and to uh, a deeper understanding. Okay, so this is an exercise for you. You can draw syntax trees uh, for these senses. There are also um, uh, online exercises where you can choose from, from pull down menus uh, labels uh, of, and trees. So you can also draw a tree and then uh, check whether you did that correctly. Um, so that, that's a very good preparation for the exam to do that online task because you can do it as often as you want and uh, make sure you understand what's going on. Okay, so this was it uh, for uh, government and binding. The next session will deal with generalized phrase structure grammar and yeah, have fun playing with the online exercises.